to great thanks Jordan. so welcome to the uh the sensei tutorial here at the ecp all hands meeting um it's the third of may 2022 so today we're going to begin with a quick um overview of of what is in situ and, and why it's important um the tutorial is going to blend uh, lecture and hands-on examples we want you to understand um, what Sensei is all about, and we have some examples, some hands-on examples that will uh, help you learn it. The objective is to have you learn more about in situ, why it's useful and needed, um, have you learn something about the Sensei architecture and interfaces, and, and have an understanding of uh, some use cases, how it might be used. And so we assume that, that you have little to no experience with um, uh, in situ, but even if you're, you know, an HPC expert, this information should be useful to you. So to begin, I'll give a quick uh, overview and introduction um, to the tutorial and, and sort of, you know, the context for today's uh, work. And then we'll have um, a, a, an overview of the Sensei architecture followed by uh, hands-on demonstrations with Sensei. And then another phase where we're doing um, a demonstration and discussion about a particular code integration, the LAMPS code uh, with Sensei. And so the team today, um, so Berlin Loring is from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. <clears throat> Sylvia Ritzi is from uh, Argonne National Lab. And I have one foot in Berkeley Lab and the other foot at uh, San Francisco State University. So let's go ahead and get started. So why, why in situ? So a few years ago, Ken Moreland made this interesting graphic. And what it does is it shows that there's about six or seven orders of magnitude difference in bandwidth, aggregate bandwidth <clears throat> across, um, you know, register, register, all the way out to disk, excuse me. <clears throat> so for example, uh, register, register, aggregate bandwidth um, on this particular machine, this is a few years old was on the order of 125 petabytes a second. But then going out to you know, DRAM aggregate uh, bandwidth, you lose two orders of magnitude of uh, bandwidth. So going from 125 petabytes a second down to about four and a half petabytes a second. But then you know, it gets worse going from node memory to the interconnect fabric on the machine, you lose another two orders of magnitude bandwidth going from four and a half petabytes a second down to about 24 terabytes a second. And then, you know, the story just continues to get worse going from the interconnect fabric out to storage on this particular machine, you lose another order of magnitude bandwidth. So 24 uh, terabytes a second down to about one and a half terabytes a second. So this is this is a pretty grim situation. And what it means is that uh, you can write out only one of every 100,000 time steps, or you can write out one of every 100,000 data values that you comp you uh, compute. And so this, you know, order, you know, five um, uh, difference in bandwidth, you know, from deep inside the machine all the way out to storage, is, has a tremendous detrimental impact on doing science. And so this particular uh, story, this trend's been going on for a long time. This is no surprise. So uh, in you know 2019, we saw you know a 1.75 petaflop system with 240 gigabytes a second in, in uh, aggregate I/O bandwidth. Um, in 2012, we got an uh, order of magnitude increase in uh, flops, but you know about the same give or take uh, in I/O, and then. In 2017, we got another order of magnitude increase in flops, and you know, a, you know, a three or four x increase in uh, I/O bandwidth. So, you know, this is this is the problem that we face. And so, in terms of you know what happens with lost science, this particular example from a few years ago, um, there was a, an accelerator modeling code team, and there there were they could only run their models in 2D because they were. Uh, running into I.O. problems. They couldn't write out data um, in a way that allowed them to do the sort of analysis that, that they wanted. And so this uh, chart on the bottom shows the results of the 2D simulation. And so the, uh, the x-axis here is um, you know, down the beam line, and the y-axis is um, uh, energy, I believe. 
And so what we're seeing is, um, you know, one particular, uh, you know, energy profile coming out of this code in 2D, but when they actually were able to run the model in 3D, they began to see, um, you know, a completely different energy profile. So this is completely different science when the models run in 3D. The reason they hadn't run it in 3D was because they were getting killed by IO. And so in this particular uh, instance, what happened was there was a, a code team at Berkeley that was working with the accelerator code team uh, also at Berkeley to instrument their code to do in situ so that they could begin to do analysis uh, of this code output. And you know, this was remarkable. So for the first time, they could begin to see output from the 3D model and compare it to the results of the 2D model. And it completely um, you know, changed uh, the landscape for accelerator modeling for this particular code team. So that, that's a motivation for why uh, in situ, you know, lost science. But let's talk a little bit about how this works. And so in a nutshell, what happens is that you want to process data while it's generated. So you have a simulation uh, in a compute loop and, you know, you, you want to do processing of the data uh, while it's still a memory without having to send it out to disk. And the idea is that you couple the simulation code to some other code, such as a visitor analysis code, and you know, move data between them. So you're not doing any IO out to persistent storage. And so this is an interesting approach. It avoids the IO bottlenecks. Uh, it gives, uh, it makes it possible to do um, analysis or visits of the full spatio-temporal resolution data. And typically you have access to you know, more computational horsepower than is possible. So the, the rule of thumb um, that's been in place for a long time it, is that you know, if you have a simulation running on uh, P ranks, um, then you write out the data and then you come back later and you use you know, P divided by 10, one tenth the number of ranks for doing analysis or this. This is just a, a rule of thumb. It's not a hard and fast set in stone thing, but the result is that there's often less um, you know, flops being brought to bear on the analysis of this prior problem. But if you do it in situ, you potentially have access to the same um, scale of uh, computational resources as when you computed the data to begin with. So the downside of all of this is that you often need to know what you're going to do in terms of analysis or this before you could before you run the simulation. And sometimes you don't know. Uh, sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't. Another con is that the you know, computational landscape is becoming increasingly complex. And so uh, what I mean here is that um, you know, gone are the days when you know, just one subroutine called does the trick for analysis or this. It's often a, a more complicated uh, processing um, pipeline, if you will. And so getting these things set up and running them uh, in situ can be um, a challenge. Uh, additional uh, problems that you might run into are uh, resource constraints. So if the simulation is running at the ragged edge of, of memory, right, it's using all the memory, there's no, there's no additional memory left on the node for doing anything else. And so this is a, a real concern. So there's a couple of different um, uh, ways to think about uh, in situ. So, the traditional approach for doing analysis or viz is you run the code, you save data out to disk, and then you load it back in later and look at it. And this is known as post hoc, post -hoc uh, processing. And it requires a 2x round trip, um, you know, or one, 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 one round trip to the system. You write stuff out and you, and you read it back in. Uh, in situ processing, you're doing the uh, analysis or viz while the data is being generated. You don't write it out to storage. And so there's a couple of different flavors here of in situ. Um, so this diagram on the left, I have a four node system and each, each node has four cores on it. And so in this particular setup uh, of the quad core node, three of the cores are dedicated to simulation, one is dedicated to in situ uh, processing. And so here the data does not move, it stays in the same, um, same, same memory space uh, as the simulation. Over on the right, my quad core system, my quad node quad core system, uh, three of the nodes are dedicated to simulation. So all four cores on each node are being used for simulation. But one of the nodes, all four cores are being used for 
the analysis or this. And so in this situation, um, data has to move. Uh, and this is known as in transit. Data has to move from the nodes where it's being computed over to the node where it's being analyzed. So in situ means data stays in place um, and you work on it, do analysis or visit with the memory in place. In transit means that you have to move it from one place to another before you do anything with it. Well, so this is just one narrow view of the potential landscape. So a couple of years ago, there was a large community uh, paper that you know, looked at the different ways that you can describe an in situ um, system. And so this business about you know, on node or off node, uh, you know, in situ versus in transit is just one um, dimension of dozens, really. So there's a bunch of other um, uh, ways to look at this. So I'm not going to go into this, but I do want to point you at this article uh, because it provides a, a lot more information. Okay, so how might you make use of this technology for doing um, uh, data analysis and this? So one scenario is where you know what you want to do before you fire up the simulation. So you might be interested in um, you know, computing an isosurface of a particular level, right, or doing some sort of uh, analysis. You know, if you're doing um, uh, astrophysics uh, supernova modeling, you want to know if the supernova blew up or not, right? So there's some specific yes or no questions or specific, um, you know, parameters that you're interested in um, studying. The other scenario is where you don't know what you're looking for. And so both of these are typical sorts of ways that people do visualization, right? So in, in the uh, exploratory visualization, you don't know what you're looking for, and you sit down on these, with the system, you load data, you start um, you know, trying different methods, you try different color tables, you try different isocontour levels, you try different seed locations for, for uh, streamlines to look for interesting things. Um, the other way is, is more analytical, where you have a hypothesis that you're testing. So, um, in order to enable support for in, uh, exploratory use, particularly uh, exploratory use in a post hoc setting, what you might do is use the in situ formulation, if you will, the in situ expression of how problems solve to create some sort of reduced size data set. Right? You might be interested in saving out only the data cells that uh, lie along a particular ISO contour level, and then you can subject those cells to some particular type of uh, analysis, right? So in this way, you're only interested really in a subset of the data that satisfies some particular condition. And so there's a lot of different um, variations on this theme that you might imagine finding the subset of interest, be it, you know, some data centric thing or some, you know, geometric thing, um, and then saving that out and then working with it later uh, in an exploratory fashion. Another idea, uh, and so this is um, one where you visualize a bunch of things, you create a lot of different data extracts and then look at them later. And so um, I think it was um, uh, yesterday, there was a, another tutorial by, um, uh, the Alpine team. And so they, you know, some of their tools and, and their um, ecosystem provide support for this sort of thing. So Sensei uh, does as well. Uh, over on the left, what we have are a bunch of different um, pr image producers, right? So you could think of coupling um, in situ infrastructure to a simulation and then producing images, um, like orbiting the camera around a viewpoint or something saving those images out and then loading them into a cinema database uh, where you then get the illusion of sort of uh, interactive exploration of 3D data, but it's not a 3D data set, it's actually a collection of 2D images that you're navigating through. So this is sort of like the old um, quick time idea. Another way that you might make use of in situ technology is to find the best set of parameters, right? So this particular example from uh, Gunter Weber uses topological methods to find the right set of isocontours for a particular data set. And so the example on the left, I think they're doing equally spaced isocontours through um, some data space. And you can see that 
you know, it makes for an interesting picture, but the isocontours are kind of all bunched up. But if you use topological information to compute the same, I don't know, 10 or so um, isocontours, um, but they're spaced out in a way that's more meaningful from a topological perspective, then the result on the right shows structure in a way that's a lot more meaningful than uh, the image on the left. Another idea, and so um, it is that you may want to run the simulation and connect it to an in situ infrastructure and have the uh, in situ infrastructure detect certain um, events that might be happening based on what's happening with the data set. And if one of these events happens, then you trigger some sort of action, right? So you might not want to um, create a derived data set until um, you know, the, the supernova is close to exploding, right? So in this way, you're skipping a lot of uh, time steps where nothing interesting scientifically is happening. But then when things scientifically interesting begin to happen, you can bring to bear um, resources to, to work with data in that regime. So in terms of um, software, so I'm going to focus primarily on the Sensei system. And so Sensei is a, is a generic um, in situ interface, which means that you can instrument the simulation code once, and then with only configuration file changes, um, you can connect to many different potential endpoints for doing analysis or visualization. Um, these, here's a, here's a quick overview of some of the different types of endpoints. So Visit and, and Pairview Catalyst are both parallel Viz applications that have um, an interface for, for use in situ. And with Sensei, you can instrument once and just by changing a configuration file, access either Pairview Catalyst or, or Visit Libsyn. You can also drop in your own user-written Python code, user-written C++ code. We can make calls to Ascent. And in fact, we've worked with the Ascent team uh, on doing tutorials talking about uh, doing this very thing. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, here uh, in this system. Um, let's see, a lot of these projects have uh, timelines and, and we have one as well. So this project's been going on since uh, August 2014 and it's been funded by Oscar Research Money. So it's undergone three competitive uh, review cycles, you know, proposals and review cycles. And um, we've had a remarkable uh, history, including running at over 1 million way parallel uh, on Mira um, a, a few years ago. We've started an annual SC workshop that focuses on in situ that's become the center of gravity for a lot of uh, in situ work. Um, we've done tutorials uh, around the world. Um, this has just been a remarkable project. So I need to update this slide to show a couple of more recent things. So last year we had a um, a tutorial, it was the second or third time with the Ascent team, a tutorial at SC21. We also did the um, ISAB21 workshop. And this year, Sensei is part of the DOE ECP data viz uh, SDK, thanks to a little bit of um, ECP money. And we're doing the ISAB uh, workshop again uh, this year. So um, that's it for the introduction. So I'm going to stop my share and turn this over to Berlin. And let me field questions if there are any while Berlin's getting set up. OK, thanks, Berlin. Uh, Berlin, I think you're muted. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great in introduction, Wes. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, to continue, continue on with the tutorial, um, I'm going to talk a little bit first about setting up for the demos, because um, along with the tutorial, we're providing a virtual uh, machine and some Docker images that um, you guys can all use later on um, to uh, try out these demos and, and play around with the uh, Sensei install. Um, and then I'm going to talk more about um, the in situ system and tool portability and uh, the in transit system and proximity portability, um, as well as our data model 
and extending the system using C++ and Python and go into some, de uh, some demos um, on Cori, um, assuming I, I can get Cori to cooperate with me. Um, so to continue on, um, first of all, um, our slide decks contain some links and some videos to help you all set up the virtual machine images um, if you wanna play with this after the fact. Um, and so these um, virtual box images contain a Sensei install um, along with um, all of the backends that we, or the major backends that we support like Catalyst, Ascent, um, Visit LibSim, Audios, Python, um, and so on. Um, and so these links can take you to the, the virtual box image and also the video for in setting it up and using it. Um, and the demos um, can be done either on Cori, um, Nurse Cori, um, Cray supercomputer, or in the, the virtual machine. And the instructions are, are basically the same once you get into the right folder. Um, and so, yeah, this, this slide has some information um, about where the demos are located. Um, and also um, the, the, the image is from um, a Supercomputing 20 tutorial, but it has this um, password um, and the user is in situ user and the password is SC20 underscore tutorial um, in case you need to do sudo or get in through the screensaver. Um, in addition to the virtual machine um, image that we have, we also have some Docker containers um, that Silvio has put together for the lamps in Sensei demo that he's going to show later. Um, and this slide details all of the setup instructions for that. And uh, Silvio may say a word or two about that when he starts up his uh, demo. Um, yeah, so moving on, um, we'd like to present some of the uh, uh, features of the Sensei in situ system and show how we um, achieve tool portability and how you can use that to Sensei to um, access different in situ and IO data movement solutions from your simulation code. Um, so if you're gonna use in situ uh, today, you've got a lot of options to choose from. Um, we've got um, these full featured high level general purpose um, visualization analysis tools. These, these tools have a lot of um, Rendering and data processing capabilities can be used on supercomputers and they have very high level data models that fits nicely the geometric data structures used by a lot of mesh based simulations. Um, in addition to those we've got transport and IO libraries that have in situ and data movement functionality like audios LibIS, and HDF5. Um, these have lower level um, data models usually but um, you can do a lot with them and uh, it's great to be able to move data around the system. Um, and, and finally, when the higher level tools, the Catalyst, the LibSim, Ascent and so on are missing functionality that a scientist might need um, for a custom physics based diagnostic, for instance, or you know, just to prototype some new diagnostic that's, that's not widely you know, known uh, amongst the viz and analytics community. Um, you want to be able to extend the in situ system using C++ or perhaps Python. Um, Python's a great option um, because it's very um, developer friendly, easy to and easy and quick to develop new solutions. And there's a lot of um, libraries available um, and, and modules. And so I think the exciting things about C++ are access to these platform portability libraries for using the heterogeneous systems that we all have now. And in Python, again, there's a lot of great an analytics functionality already available that you can access to build um, very um, complex um, analyses quickly. Um, and so with Sensei's generic in situ capability, we package all of these solutions up and um, we provide them to um, your simulation uh, through a single simple um, API. And so Sensei's value proposition is that when you instrument your code with Sensei, you get access to multiple um, in situ processing and data movement uh, tools and capabilities through a single API. And this provides you tool portability in that you can use um, a configuration file at runtime to select the data processing or movement tool of your choice. And um, from the back end data processors, the Ascent, Paraview Catalyst, LibSim, and so on. Um, they get um, portability in between the different simulations if they have 
um, a sensei um, adapter implemented, then any simulation instrumented with sensei can be using their functionality. Um, a second dimension that we provide is proximity portability. And by this, we mean um, the ability to switch in between a tightly coupled in situ um, configuration over to a loosely coupled in transit uh, configuration so that the analysis and the simulation become decoupled um, and the data can move to a different set of compute nodes. And the portability is achieved in the same way that we achieve the tool portability um, via runtime um, configuration file. Um, and finally, um, we provide a means for user-defined or custom in situ um, through runtime extensible Python code or a con compile time um, ex extension with C++. Um, so how does it all work? Um, at the core of it, we've got our data model that provides a common format for data exchanges in between the simulation and the tools. Um, we use this concept of adapters. And these adapters um, abstract away the differences in between the various codes involved, the simulation, for instance, and the analytics codes. Um, we, Sensei comes with a library of ready to use adapters um, so that you don't have to write um, these adapters from scratch, you can just use the ones that are already there um, via this configuration file mechanism. Um, and so the runtime configuration mechanism um, lets you select these processing and movement solutions at runtime. Um, and so um, the picture that I want you guys to have in your head when you're, when you're thinking about Sensei is this um, here diagram where we've got a simulation and a bunch of data analytics capabilities um, with Sensei in the middle. Um, and so this is the tightly coupled or in situ, in situ um, setup where we've got the simulation, the an analysis running in the same address space. Um, at runtime, um, XML given to the Sensei system is going to select one of those um, data analytics or data movement solutions on, on the right. And then as the simulation um, evolves, um, its state in time, um, it's going to invoke in situ processing through the, the Sensei API, and the data is going to be processed or moved as it's generated. Um, so delving into this a little bit more um, from a developer perspective, we've got three main parts of the Sensei internals. Um, the first is the analysis adapter. Um, the analysis adapter provides the API that the simulation can use to invoke processing in I.O. Second, we've got a data adapter. The data adapter um, is used by the analysis adapter to fetch data from the simulation. And finally, we've got the bridge code, which is the code that's added to the simulation that manages these adapters and invokes the in-situ processing. Um, when you go at a much you know, finer grain of detail, we've got this diagram that shows the relationship of all these different parts and how, how they relate. Um, and the, the colored boxes actually show um, a couple of different specific components. The green box shows the configurable analysis adapter. Um, this is kind of a meta adapter that the simulation deals with. Um, this configurable analysis adapter is going to parse XML and create a library specific analysis adapter instance. Um, and the configurable analysis adapter lets the simulation interface to a single thing and have access to all of backends through the same API. And it, it also gives the system its runtime configurability. Um, nested within that green box, um, we've got a, sim a blue box, um, the simulation specific data adapter. That's something the simulation passes into the analysis adapter. And that lets the analysis adapter fetch data um, that it needs um, based on how it's configured. Um, the most- well, then, the, the, There's yes. a question here that, that may be maybe relevant to respond now from Maya. Uh, how, how much of the memory impact does the Sensei adapter cost? Um, the, the impacts are very, um, low and we actually, we measured this, um, we, we did, um, an analysis of the impacts of, of the, our design, um, at scale, 
um, in SC16. And um, there's actually a, an SC16 paper about this. I think I have a slide later. So um, I'll, uh, I'll pause later and point you to that slide if it's hidden. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Are there, are there, are there anything else, Silvio? Um, no, and, and actually Wes responded also in chat. Okay, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so finally at the very, you know, most nested level in this, this diagram is the in-situ library, which um, the uh, eventually gets the data and processes it. Um, so I'm gonna skip all of this. I've just said that, yeah. So about the runtime configuration. Um, so there are different, there are a couple different dimensions of the runtime configuration I wanna point out. So first of all, the configurable analysis, this is the meta adapter that the simulation uses. And um, the simulation will, will point the configurable analysis to an XML file. The configurable analysis adapter internally all, all automatic to the user parses this XML and creates a, a specific instance of one of the, um, the other, uh, data processing or movement backends and configures it all from the XML. Then as the simulation invokes in situ processing, all of that is forwarded on um, to the, the library specific adapter, which then in turn forwards it to the um, library itself. Um, so that's the sensei part of the picture, but you've also got the configuration of the data processing or data movement libraries. Um, and as mentioned, um, we expose some parameters via the XML, but we don't um, expose everything. And for these more complicated tools like Paraview Catalyst, Visit LibSim, um, or Ascent, um, we've got, um, we, we just simply make use of their configuration uh, mechanisms. Um, for, the, for example, some of those tools have JSON files or state or session files, and the XML just points to one of their specific configs. Um, at this point, I want to pause and go through a quick example um, showing um, of how the system can be used. And for this example, we're going to use AMRX. It's um, a publicly available um, framework for developing adaptive mesh refined simulation codes. And the slide shows some of the example um, types of scientific codes that have been developed with AMRX. And AMRX also comes with a Sensei integration. And, and so this integration can be used to process data through MRX. So it's a good, it's also a good way to play with Sensei. Um, and in, in this example, um, we're gonna, first we're gonna start off with um, running Sensei AMRX coupled to LibSim through Sensei. And um, we're gonna do this on using one of the, the CFD codes developed in AMRX called IAMR and we're gonna compute um, a Raleigh Taylor instability and visualize that with visit LibSim. And so this shows the uh, Sensei XML that we used in this run. So in this run, we um, used um, Cori uh, at NERSC and, and ran it in uh, 2000 um, MPI ranks. And um, so, so the, the Sensei XML is going to select LibSim um, and then it's also going to pass libsim this configuration file, this session file. And that session file was um, generated from uh, visit itself. It, there's an ability to save out a session file from the visit GUI. Um, and this is what that run looked like um, uh, with the Redley Taylor instability. We had it set to four levels of refinement and again ran it on 2048. Um, MPI ranks on Cori. Um, so now um, to demonstrate the tool portability part of Sensei, um, the ability to switch in between these data processing backends at runtime, we're gonna do the same run again, but give um, the system this different XML file. And this XML file, um, similar to the previous one, is gonna tell Sensei which um, back end to use. And in this case, it's going to be a catalyst. And then we're going to give the catalyst back end this configuration file, which we generated from the pair of GUI. And rerun the run. And just by giving a different XML file, we get this totally different result where the data is processed using pair of catalyst.
Um, at this point, I want to um, switch gears and um, go into the proximity, the proximity, proximity portability features of Sensei. And this is how, um, going into the details of how we do in transit or process data on a different set of nodes while the simulation is running. And Wes did a great job of uh, introducing this slide. And so um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, but um, this, you know, showing the bottlenecks in the system as you go through different parts of the memory hierarchy. And, you know, so the motivation for in situ processing is to get away from this, this extreme bottleneck um, of the post processing mode where you've got to go through all of these funnels and bottlenecks to get out to disk and finally process your data. Um, it's just impractical to do that these days. But in situ processing, um, when you're running in the tightly coupled mode, you've got the fastest access to data and you can possibly access the full spatiotemporal temporal resolution of your data as it's being produced. Um, in the in transit mode though, um, you're sitting in the middle and it's still much faster than writing the data to disk. Um, and there are some um, additional benefits um, like the ability to impedance match the scaling of the simulation and the data processing libraries, for instance, or to transform the data um, and provide different load balancing um, in flight. So there are some, some really cool things that you can do from in, within transit. Um, and so I want to just introduce some terminology. And so I've got this diagram of a, ficti a fictitious um, high-performance computing system. And when we say um, M to N in transit analysis, we wanna, we're, we're meaning that the simulation is running on M MPI ranks. And this is shown in the figure is red. It's got a number of data blocks, P data blocks. These are, are shown in, as little yellow blocks inside of the simulation processes. And then we want to run our analysis job on a different set of nodes on that system. But the, the analysis job, um, it may be um, running at a different level of concurrency and we use N to denote that level of currency. So in this example, M equals nine, P equals 13 and N equals three. Um, so in order to make this work, we've got to do a partitioning step to decide how the, the data blocks map from the M simulation ranks to the N analysis ranks. Um, once that partitioning step's done, we can finally um, use a transport to move the data, and then it can be processed on the, the analysis um, job. Um, so the, the user view of this um, in-transit architecture in Sensei, um, we've got this, the similar picture as before. We've got the simulation, and um, it's tightly coupled over to this transport analysis adapter. And this the purpose of this um, transport analysis adapter is to move data. So the simulation is running in a, one job on the HPC system. And then we've got the second um, executable called an endpoint running on a second job. And this endpoint is something that comes with Sensei. It's built into the system. When you compile Sensei, this is an executable that gets produced. So all of this in the second job, running in the second job is, is something you don't have to do. It's you only have to configure it at runtime, but it's it's a key part of the system. Um, so in both of these jobs, um, Sensei is going to use XML to configure the, the data movement transport and the simulation. Um, also in uh, the endpoint, there, it needs to get that same XML to configure the transport on that side. And then um, another XML to configure the data processing backend. Um, so, um, that's how the system's configured, and um, when it runs, um, as the simulation is generating data, um, the transport um, moves the data across the network, and it's processed as it's being generated, albeit on a different set of nodes. Um, so, you know, the the design details of this part, this configuration for Sensei is is much more complicated, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this, but the uh, the first the top um, box shows the architecture for the simulation, and that's the same as we did we showed before. Um, everything's the same. The XML just configures a data movement transport instead of a data processing library. In the endpoint, um, we've got the configurable analysis adapter 
that's configured by XML, so very similar, um, the same mechanism, the same um, classes, that's configuring the in-situ library that's actually processing the data when it's received. Now, the, the key difference um, is this red box, um, and this is a transport specific um, data adapter. And this has a number of interesting features, which I won't go into detail in this tutorial, but um, for instance, the partitioning um, block in here and the partitioning implementation in Sensei is um, adaptable at runtime. And so this is something that um, you can provide your own code to um, implement different partitioning schemes. And partitioning schemes, again, they load balance um, the data um, when the simulation and the analysis are running on different levels of concurrency. There are a number of other um, interesting things that one can do, such as in-flight data transformations. And so that's a, a really interesting part of the system. I'm just going to skip through all of the rest of this. Um, and show this, um, this example of the partitioning infrastructure. So in this example, we've got, uh, we're computing a slice in situ and the simulations data blocks are shown here. Um, the ones in color were needed for the calculation of the slice and the grayed out ones are, were not needed. In a second example, we're con computing isosurfacing extracts. Um, the color, again, the colored blocks were the ones from the simulation that were actually needed and the, the grayed out were not needed for the calculation. Um, so um, with Sensei's partitioning infrastructure, we can actually provide optimized partitioners that don't move all of those gray blocks. Only the color of one gets moved. Um, and we explored um, those type of um, data movement optimizations in this paper link down at the bottom of the slide. So you can go there for more information on that. Um, so a bit about the data model. Um, so we use VTK and in the latest release of uh, Sensei, um, we've mangled and minified um, VTK9 for our data model. Um, and the, the types of data that are supported are all these geometric mesh types um, provided by VTK, including you know, adaptive mesh, um, particle or point clouds, unstructured finite element meshes, and so on, and a number of non-geometric data structures, such as tables and graphs, and array collections. So it's got pretty good coverage. Um, by mangled, I mean we just renamed all of the classes and source files from VTK to SVTK. And that prevents it conflicting from other um, versions of VTK that may be um, floating around in the system, such as those used by Paravi Catalyst or Visit Libsim. And we've minified it, removing, re meaning we've removed absolutely everything except for the data model from our um, copy. And so this, this, um, this approach lets us use VTK, but it isolates us against breaking changes in VTK so we can provide more stability in our code base. And it keeps us version independent of the different versions of VTK used by the other tools. But you can still use VTK for processing because of the mangling. So you can link in a, a copy of your own VTK if you want to use it for rendering or, or filtering. Um, at this point, I just want to pause um, because there was a, this question about the overheads. And uh, so um, we, uh, in SC16, we did a paper where we analyzed um, at scale a number of different um, in situ processing um, approaches or, or algorithms. And we measured the actual overheads that the Sensei system introduced. And um, there's a, you know, there's a link um, down in the bottom of the slide to um, the paper, the SE16 paper. And the plots just basically show um, the conclusion um, or the data that we gathered. And the conclusion was that the runtimes were really negligible. Um, the impacts on runtime and memory use were really negligible. Um, so I need to, go in. So for my demos, I uh, want to use Cori and I need to go in and fire up Cori at this point. <clears throat> um, and so I'm uh, for my demos here, we're going to um, illustrate the proximity portability and the tool portability. Um, and um, for that, we're going to need to use two nodes so that we can have one of the simulation job running on one node and the analysis job running on the second. Um, this is going to take maybe a second. It's usually pretty quick. 
Um, so I'm going to get some nodes while I'm um, actually going to this next part of the uh, slide. Um, so um, in terms of extending um, Sensei, we, we think this is an important um, part of the system is to be able to easily extend it because um, a lot of the great tools and functionality that we provide um, via like the Paraview Catalyst or the Ascent um, backends um, don't meet all the needs of the users. Um, there's a lot of functionality missing out of those because they're very general purpose. So um, scientists may need to add um, new diagnostics. And so one can do that with C++ and Sensei, and this is a template for that. Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You have to override a single method and execute method. And uh, Sylvia is going to go into more details about that, but I've shown just that you put your code there. You get the data adapter from the simulation. You can use that to fetch data and push it through your processing um, code, whatever that may be. Um, we also have a, a, a runtime extensibility feature um, via Python, and we call this Python analysis backend. And it enables use of Python um, through a user provided Python script, um, which is passed to our XML. And this, this enables simulations written in C++ or Fortran to access Python um, without any additional coding other than the Sensei instrumentation. Um, and this is uh, the template um, for implementing one of those user defined in situ um, analyses with Python. Um, and the initialize and finalize methods are option, optional, um, but they definitely are going to uh, need to implement an execute method. Again, it's the same kind of idea that the data adapter is passed in, and you can use that to fetch data and do whatever you want with it. Um, there's more information, um, including some examples linked into this paper at the bottom of the slide deck. OK, so at this point, we're going to hopefully do our demos. And to set these up, um, we've configured our oscillator mini app that comes with uh, Sensei to be configured as a, a proxy for a chemical reaction on a 2D substrate. Um, and so we've we've done we can set up the backends or all of the XML and, and configuration for the backends to render a pseudocolor plot um, along with uh, an ISO surfacing value of one. And so the renderings um, that we generated in situ from Libsim and Catalyst are shown here. So those are the results. Um, so I've set up six runs. I'm not going to run through all of them, um, but uh, you know, the slides show how to run each one. Um, but so there, there are two categories. There are three in each category. So we've got uh, tool portability runs that show switching out the data processing backend using XML. And we've got the proximity portability runs. And, and these show um, running um, in the in-transit configuration where data is moved to a different node. Um, so in these, I've set up the shell scripts to dump different parts um, of the output in different colors. So first of all, the XML configuration that was used is going to be displayed in cyan. Um, and the first jobs output is run, displayed in red. And in the in situ configuration, there's only one job. But when you go to the in transit um, configuration, there's two. And that jobs output is going to be displayed in green. Um, ew. My allocation hasn't gone through yet. Of course. Um, well, it was very, it was very fast getting through this morning. Um, so while that's waiting, I'm I'm going to move on for a second. We'll come back to that. I'll check that demo um, in a second, and then we'll check the, the allocation in a second um, and talk a little bit about uh, the Python demo. So this is the, the, the demo is configured such that the, uh, the proxy app is configured in the same way. Um, and we've got this movie showing that. And again, this is supposed to be a, a chemical reaction on a 2D substrate. So um, the reaction rate's changing, and we're doing this iso contour of uh, at a value of one, 
And so the idea with this Python analysis code is that we're going to compute the area of the substrate where the reaction rate exceeds a threshold of one. Um, and, and so in this uh, demo, we've got, this is the full Python code for that calculation of computing the, where the area exceeds a value of one. Um, and this, uh, and I'm just gonna, you know, walk you through this code. And so on the right, I'm just showing a zoomed in version so that we can read it. Um, of the first part is about initialization. So we've got these control variables um, that are global variables that control some of the parameters like the thresholding, the name of the mesh, the name of the arrays we're going to process, and the output file. Um, and uh, this is can these global variables can be modified at runtime through our XML. So this box shows the um, XML that's used with this with this run. And um, similarly to some of the other um, XML examples I've shown, um, we're telling Sensei to use Python. Um, so the configurable analysis is going to create a Python analysis adapter, and it's going to pass in this area above.py script, and that's the script that we're reading. Um, it's got this initialized source um, XML element that actually gives Python code that can be that's going to be executed um, during initialization, and these are going to set the the values um, of the control variables in our Python script. So we're going to tell it to do a threshold of the value of one, the name of the mesh, the name of the array, and so on. <clears throat> um, our execute method, which does all the processing, is passed to data adapter. We use that to get to fetch the mesh from the simulation, and then we iterate over the blocks and do the calculation. The calculation is shown down here using NumPy. <clears throat> and then um, as that runs, uh, rank zero is going to um, do uh, accumulate um, the result um, from all the other, we do this reduction, right, um, from all the ranks um, to compute the total area, and then rank zero is going to um, accumulate that and store that. And at the very end of the calculation, rank zero is going to make the make the file and save the figure to disk. Okay, and so that is a, a full example um, of the Python. Hmm. Let's see if I can get this to go. Usually this is very quick um, to go through the queue. Um, okay, I'm so since I'm having some trouble getting through the queue at this point, um, I'm wondering if I can pass the baton over to Silvio. Oh, wait, okay. It looks like it went through the queue. Um, so I don't know what happened um, with the first submission, but um, I just got my notes. Um, so now I'm in this demo, this audios demo script uh, directory. And if you're on the virtual machine, you'll actually see these very same scripts. Um, and um, they've just been modified to point to different, um, different sets of module files. Um, otherwise, the scripts are identical to the virtual machine. And I've got my in situ scripts show the to, to demonstrate the tool portability and the in-transit scripts to dem demonstrate the proximity portability. So um, with that, I'm gonna launch one of these. Um, I'm gonna start out with the catalyst and run catalyst in situ. And so what's gonna happen is we're gonna load the module file for our Sensei install. We're gonna, um, run the oscillator mini app configured as this um, proxy simulation of a chemical reaction on a 2d substrate um, we're passing in uh, this teal xml file i catted here um, that configures catalyst and uh, selects catalyst and configures it with this rendering script um, and now the red is the output from the simulation as it runs and we've just got a status message that um, that we've configured um, for Catalyst. Um, now these are on the compute nodes. Um, so I've got two compute nodes here and I'm running on the compute nodes, but I can't have X11 capabilities on those compute nodes. So I have this other window where I'm, I'm logged on to Cori and I have the same, um, the same folder. 
and I can see that we're generating, you know, the images, um, things are running. And now I can uh, animate these to look at the output um, really quickly. And so this is showing the result. We've rendered 100 frames using Paraview Catalyst. Um, and this is going to quickly show the result. So we've got the chemical reaction evolving. The, um, the area where the reaction rate is uh, one is bound by this black contour. And, and so, oops, let's see, cool. So that was using uh, Paraview Catalyst. Now I have a clean script just to wipe out all those images. And so now we're back to a clean state and I, I can run this again um, using Ascent. And um, in this run, the major differences are that I'm loading a different module file and I'm giving a different XML file um, to the system. Um, and now things have started up and the simulation is running and this is, this is an output from Ascent. Um, and since it's a little bit more verbose than Catalyst, but it's running, producing images. Let's go into our other terminal and just look and see what's going on. Um, now, if I look at these, these are the, the same results um, generated with Ascent. And so rather than animate them, I'm just gonna show pop up one of them and you can see the similarities in that this is rendered by Ascent, the same data, the same ISO value. Um, So we'll just, a sense pretty quick, we'll just let that continue. And we've got all our results, so I'm gonna wipe it out. Now, I've also got um, scripts here to run um, libsim, but I'm gonna skip those um, for the sake of time. Um, the same thing happens, but you know the results are rendered with libsim. Um, I'm gonna move on to the um, in transit side of the demo. And um, just talk about that for a second. I want to mention a couple of the details. Um, okay, so in uh, the proximity portability demos, we're going to run the script, but there's two parallel MPI jobs. The first is our oscillator. It's configured exactly the same as in the in situ runs but we're gonna tell um, the oscillator to use Audios. The Audios is gonna move the data to a second job. The second job is the Sensei endpoint. And the Sensei endpoint is gonna be configured to use Audios and then one of the, the data processing backends. So there's two XML configurations used for the endpoint. Um, So other than those XML fig, uh, configurations and the SRUN, um, the different the two different SRUN commands, this is very much similar to running in the in-situ configuration. Um, so to get the jobs to launch on different sets of nodes, we use this dash R option to SRUN. And th that just tells which job, uh, which node to place the second job on. And so um, that's a key detail for doing this. <clears throat> Um, now to go back to my window um, to launch this, um, I want the transit. I'll do catalyst first. Um, we're loading the catalyst module file, just very much similar to as before. Now we've got the different XML files here. The first one is given to the oscillators. This tells um, the oscillator to use um, FlexPath. We give a second um, XML uh, to the endpoint. And then finally, the catalyst um, config um, also to the endpoint. Um, the simulation starts up, configures itself. The endpoint starts up, configures itself. And now the, this is, these are status messages coming out of the endpoint telling us that it processed a time step. Um, and so we're generating data on one set of nodes and processing it on a separate set of nodes. Um, and now we can see the, the tools are running. We're producing the images just as before. Mm. 
And just to, to verify, we get the same result as we did before. It's just that the data was processed, decoupled from the simulation on a different set of nodes. Um, and uh, again, we can do this with, um, with other tools. Um, we can do it with Ascent. Um, actually, I'm gonna clean out these images just to keep things nice. We're back to our clean state. I can run the, um, the script that launches the setup with Ascent. And the main difference here are these XML files. The Adios XML files are the same. Um, the um, rendering XML file was different um, and that was given to the endpoint. And so that those XML files that were, were used to configure for rendering were the same ones that we used for the in-situ configuration. Um, and now we're running with Adios in transit. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, Adios in transit with ascent processing the data and rendering the data. And so again, we get the, the similar result, but I'll just display one of these um, just to verify. Um, and yeah, we've got our result. Um, so um, that is the in-transit tool and proximity portability demo. I'm going to move on to the Python demo. Um, this is also installed in the, the virtual box, and it shows a full um, working example of using the, the Python capabilities of Sensei. And um, just um, for more information in the configs directory in here, we've got the Python script, this um, volume above .sm. .py. Um, we've got the XML and oscillator configs in there as well. Um, so on my compute nodes, I'm going to switch over into that Python directory and uh, let's see, dry up here, oscillator Python. This is similar in that the script is going to load um, the desired um, module um, that has Sensei set up um, for use with Python. Um, it's going to pass uh, the XML config that selects the Python um, backend, um, and it passes all the configuration in terms of the script that we're going to use, and then this initialized source, which lets us set some global control variables. Um, we've got the status telling that the oscillator um, set everything up, and that run completed. Um, when I go in and look at, we generated this random 2D64 Python image at the end, um, and let's look at that. And that's the plot of the um, area um, where the reaction rate was above one as a simulation evolved. And so you've got this weird curve that as the simulation evolved, the area um, above one grew, then shrunk, and then grew again. And so this um, is kind of a, a segue into using Python for triggering and um, any other type of analysis that you'd like to do. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, end my part of the tutorial and uh, pass it on over to Silvio. Um, happy to take any questions if there are any at this point. And if not, uh, pass it on over. So Thank you, Berlin. Let me share my screen. Are you seeing my presenter mode or uh, my? I'm seeing presenter mode. Let's switch here. Stop this place. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm Silvio Rizzi from the Argonne National Laboratory, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. And I'm, I'm going to cover uh, the instrumentation of the LAMPS code with Sensei. This is uh, an example, and I'm showing a picture here. That's so, so, so you make sure that there's no machine talking to you, there's a real person here. So um, the LAMPS code essentially is a large scale atomic molecular massively parallel simulator. simulator that's, that's where the name comes from. 
Uh, it's been developed uh, for uh, quite a few years now at, at Sandia, and it, it's a code that scales well. Uh, it runs nicely on uh, pretty much all supercomputer architectures. Um, so uh, there, there's, um, there's a good motivation to use it, explore it, and, and see how it can perform in situ with Sensei. So what we wanted to do initially in, in, a, in our first exploration, and, and you can see a reference to a paper uh, down there, uh, it is essentially enable interactive visualization of the data in situ, right? Um, you know, when these simulations are running, they take a lot of time. Um, it, it, it may take a lot of time actually for every time step and for structures to, to start developing. So some people might question, uh, uh, why are you doing uh, in situ interactive visualization? Well, it's, it's, it's mostly a proof of concept, right? Essentially, we want to show that it's possible to do it. Uh, and since we were working with the uh, Intel team, uh, they have Osprey as the um, as, as a ray tracing framework, uh, and we also wanted to leverage uh, the the Osprey uh, library for uh, creating high quality images out of the data that comes uh, in situ. So. Based on the Sensei architecture that uh, we've described before, this is the uh, the parts that we'll we'll be concentrating on in in the next few minutes. Right, it's the left side of, of the picture where we have lamps, uh, and lamps is built as a library. We have a small portion of code in C++ that we call it lamps driver, and that essentially re uh, receives uh, the input file and passes it to the lamps as a library line by line. And then from there, we have our sensor instrumentation that consists of a bridge, a data adapter, and an analysis adapter. So the data format in this case is particularly easy because this is atoms. So they come in X, Y, and Z coordinates. And there's additional fields, like for example, atom type, or atom ID. So we can query all those from lamps and actually make them available to Sensei on the other side of the instrumentation. And the, the way of instrumenting the code is actually pretty clever and, and it comes from the lamps code itself. Uh, they have uh, something called a fixed external, which actually allows uh, the developer to um, create a callback uh, so every time there's a new time step, that callback will, will receive a call with pointers to the data. And there's additional information in, in the link that I'm uh, presenting here for those interested. So remember, we need to do this, implement this three components, the bridge, the data adapter, and uh, the analysis adapter. So we'll, we'll start with the bridge, which is the simplest. And if you see the, the, the pseudocode uh, that I'm showing here, uh, uh, it's essentially very simple, right? That the, um, the lines in black are represent the original simulation, the lines in blue, the ones we want to add for the instrumentation, right? Um, so essentially there's an, uh, an initialization step after every compute time step, we call the in situ execute. And prior to finalizing, uh, you just we, we call the, the, the finalize uh, uh, function in, in our existing code, right? So, and here I have a, a number of annotations that will simplify what we're trying to, uh, the, the ideas that, that we're trying to explain here. So this is the callback function. As, as, as I explained, there's a callback function that you need to implement and LAMPS will call it with data every time there's a new time step. So as part of the data, you get pointers to the X, Y, and Z atom coordinates. And then uh, you can also query atom types Next step is essentially to update the bridge with the data that we got from lamps. And then we call the analyze function. 
that's essentially all we need to do on the lamps side. We don't need to modify the code. And that, that's one of the major uh, implications here. Uh, this, this is all the code uh, we add uh, to lamps uh, and call it as a library. So the bridge, uh, very simple that there's a, an initialization of the uh, adapters, both, uh, and there's also the uh, uh, initialization of the configurable analysis. And uh, let's remember that the configurable analysis allows us to use an XML file to actually configure what we want the Sensei analysis to do. And I'll, I'll show examples of this. So in this part, we are covering lines one and two, essentially, or more, mostly two, the, the, the one in blue, right? So that, that's the initialization. Then we need to execute the, the in situ part. And from this, we get all the parameters, all the data that we received at every time step of uh, lamps uh, running the simulation, update the adapter, and then call the execute method. And so with this, we're taking care of the middle part of it. So we do it in every time step. And finally, this, this is almost trivial, uh, a call to finalize because we want to uh, shut down everything gracefully before we finalize the sim. And, and now we can move to explain, uh, move on to explain the, the data adapter essentially. So uh, as, as it's been mentioned before, uh, we rely on the VTK uh, uh, data model. So uh, one of the VTK objects that runs, uh, that, that uh, lends itself very well to represent atoms is uh, VTK polydata, because you can actually put the coordinates of each point and uh, you can actually populate the coordinates of every atom in the points of the VTK poly data structure. So that's, that's essentially uh, what we're doing here. And so um, the, we need to create the, something called the VTK mesh and respond to the get mesh method that is part of the Sensei API, right? So this is what we need to implement as, as programmers as in, uh, and on the in situ part on the in situ side of the instrumentation, right? So uh, the analysis in this case uh, must request a uh, mesh that we call atoms, and, and it's an arbitrary name, but it, 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 it must respond to that name, otherwise it will be ignored or, or returned actually with an error. And then we created this BTK polydata object to contain the coordinates and the fields for the atoms. Uh, there's, there's additional information here about the, um, uh, the pointers uh, actually to uh, point array where the, that, that will be part of the polydata containing the point coordinates. And there's also cells needed in BTK objects. So we create them and populate them here. Now, another important part of the Sensei API is the add array method. And here we're illustrating how we do it in LAMPS. Again, uh, every time the analysis wants to do something, it must request a specific mesh, which in this case we're calling atoms. Again, uh, the point that there's, there's multiple uh, field associations uh, that we can specify. In this case, uh, these are points because that's, that's what works best for atoms. Uh, and there's two different arrays that we can actually add here. One is the atom type and one is the atom ID. So all that will be available in the BTK polydata structure. Something interesting to show here is that the, we need to create metadata to give the in transit uh, implementation additional information to make the good decisions, right? So that's what we do here in uh, creating and populating the, the metadata, right? We're specifying additional information that is not possible to, it doesn't come in, in, in BTK objects. 
so the in transit methods can do some intelligent, uh, make some intelligent decisions there. Now, this is uh, an example of the XML configuration file that I mentioned before. This is a general example, but you can see how you can specify different types of analysis. For example, one of the lines is actually uh, requesting a histogram with a mesh uh, named Adams and using the right type, right, with a point association. And uh, it's using 67 bins to uh, create that histogram. That 67 was an arbitrary number, but it, it was tweaked by hand to give a good result. Uh, similarly, we can enable post hoc IO, which means essentially save files in VTK format. And I will demonstrate that uh, later. And then uh, another option, for example, is to enable the catalyst analysis adapter that you, that you see at the bottom of the page. And you're telling it to use a Python script, right? And in, in this case, you give it the name of that Python script that you generate with the uh, pair of you uh, client. Uh, and then it, it will run that specific pipeline in situ when you enable the, uh, the catalyst analysis adapter. So this is super powerful. Now, this is a demo. Uh, I'm, uh, we're gonna switch uh, gears here to a quick demo. Uh, and in this case, this is gonna be the interactive uh, visualization of in situ data computed with lamps. And uh, I'm mentioning Osprey here um, because that, this, this is the, the slide that I borrowed from the uh, Intel team at the time. This is actually a paper from 2017. And, and notice that uh, they are actually talking about CPU ray tracing framework because at that time they were focusing on the CPU. But now uh, with the arrival of Aurora, they're actually targeting the Intel GPUs. So we're, we're work, working closely with them to implement the Osprey framework on the Intel GPUs. And the data that we use actually comes from real material science uh, at Argon. Uh, they were running the, this team of scientists, Argon scientists uh, were running lamps. This, this was not a huge simulation uh, because of the number of atoms there. And, and it was actually running on Mira, the, um, a machine that has been already decommissioned at Argon, a BGQ, IBM BGQ supercomputer at Argon. But we got the files, we got the input files from them. Uh, and notice the, the structures that, that you see in the cover of the journal. Uh, you will see that uh, the in situ instrumentation when we visualize uh, generates very similar structures to that. And so here we expand the previous picture, right? Now we can analyze the, the right side of it where there's uh, uh, Levi-S, which is a, a very lightweight transport that we used at the time uh, that connects to one side of the analysis adapter and then through the network connects to a client and from there to the Osprey viewer. So all this was a prototype that, that, that we created uh, and published in uh, 2018. So again, LAMPS is built as a library. And this is in transit because there's data movement through the network and we're communicating nodes through the network, moving data through the network. And the, the viewer actually runs on, uh, on a, a remote machine. So um, this is a simple demo that, that uh, I'm gonna show here in a pre-recorded video. This is actually created, captured in a workstation where everything runs um, in the same place. But this uh, solution actually was shown and implemented, demonstrated actually at scale on the Theta supercomputer and on, on the TAC supercomputer uh, Stampede, Stampede 2, I think. So let me play the video and actually pause here because you see uh, three different terminals. Uh, the first is uh, the actual lamps simulation. And then 
let's play a bit and, and see how the uh, simulation is already generating data. This is actually a very simple example that comes with LAMS. It's one of the benchmarks. And now you can see how the, um, the other components are launching and, and doing their job, right? So there's a, a network client and here uh, it is actually receiving the data from the in-situ. And my uh, PowerPoint crashed. Are, are you receiving, are you still receiving images? I can see your screen, but the PowerPoint is gone. Okay, so let me share again. It's unfortunate that sometimes when I play videos, it crashes. So let's try again. Uh, the question is, where were you able to see the, the pictures generated and how the user can interact with it? Um, we got up to the point where the mesh got rotated. Okay, okay. So that's probably good. And I, I can probably move on to the next. Uh, and let me go back to my Zoom. Stop share. And let's share again, hoping that it doesn't crash again. Sorry for the technical issues. I'm in Zoom, share screen. Yes. Hey, uh, Sylvia, this is yeah. Wes. I just yes. want to mention the time. Yeah, okay. So uh, how much time do we have? Just a couple of minutes. Okay, so let me let me quickly go over this. Um, so, are are you receiving my my screen? It's in uh, presenter mode. We see this slide and the next one. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, so what I wanted to show uh, here in this example is another uh, in transit workflow using uh, DOS, uh, and in this case, lamps generates the data. Uh, through Adios in the network, uh, it, it passes to the Sensei endpoint and it generates VTK files that can be visualized uh, with Paraview. That's essentially the workflow that I wanted to illustrate. And the important thing here, I'm going to skip, is this link that I put in the, on the chat. Uh, all the resources to actually reproduce this workflow are, uh, are there, right? So there's files. Uh, there's a description file, there's the XML files that you need to run this, uh, the consumer and producer scripts to launch it. So this was demonstrated actually on the Theta GPU uh, partition of Theta, which is essentially NVIDIA GPUs, connecting to a visualization cluster called Cooley on Argon. So it's uh, 16 ranks on Theta GPU connecting to two Cooley uh, uh, visualization ranks. So that's uh, essentially what I wanted to show, give you the pointer so that you can reproduce this. And let me try to quickly play the video. And with that, I will conclude. I hope it doesn't crash again. So on the left, you see Theta GPU launching the producer. On the right, there's Cooley actually launching the consumer. And again, you can see on the left, uh, data generated by LAMPS. On the right, the data adapter, the ADIOS data adapter and, and post hoc IO have been configured and they're receiving the first time step. Uh, now they move to time step number one. So you can see how data is being generated and consumed on the, the other side. Uh, it's uh, for, for simplicity is and demonstration purposes, it's, it, it, it just uh, runs five time steps. So it will uh, finish quickly here. And the final thing to show is that after the final time step, the VTK files have been generated on the remote side, right? On the 
on Cooley. So there's, there's a directory there with called BTK extracts. And the BTK files are there. So essentially, this shows how, how you run on two different machines. Uh, one, one of them instrumented for in situ runs through the simulation and move it to your analysis resource. With this, I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll give it back to uh, Wes for a wrap up. Great, thanks, thanks, Sylvia. So thanks everybody for hanging in there. Just a couple of more words and then we'll, um, we'll move on here. So the point here is that uh, our ability to compute information far exceeds our ability to save it to storage and work with it. And so there's an opportunity to do new and interesting science by doing more analysis and does, et cetera, uh, while the data is still in memory. Some next stops. Um, here's some reading. Uh, one of these, these articles, the first one is the uh, community work, community report on different ways to look at the in-situ problem space. The second is a brochure from an Oscar workshop a couple of years ago describing um, you know, research challenges in the in-situ space. Uh, the third is a um, state-of-the-art report from Eurovis in 2016, giving you know, an overview of the state-of-the-art of in-situ processing uh, at that time. And then the final two are uh, papers from SC16, one describing the Sensei generic in-situ interface, and the other is the performance study where we're looking at the uh, impact of the interface on simulations, what run at scale. So we welcome your feedback. Um, please feel free to send us a note, uh, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what can we do better, uh, et cetera. Um, that's how we can make this better for you. Uh, finally, thank you. Uh, we acknowledge your participation in this event, the ECP meeting organizers and our funders. And um, until next time, be safe and be well. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.